you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be back in Texas. I grew up down the road in Lake Jackson, went to Baylor University. Any Baylor grads? And much to the chagrin of my mother, I married a girl and met a girl and married a girl from Kentucky. This still rankles my mother to this day. And if you're watching, Mom, I'm sorry, but I will come home and visit. I promise. I have so many relatives in Texas, I can't name them all. But I do have two of my brothers here, and I want them to stand up wherever they are. My younger brother's a doctor in Fort Worth, Robert Paul. And my older brother is a chemical engineer, Ronnie and Peggy Paul are here also from Lake Jackson. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I've been a little bit annoyed with the president lately. <laughs> releasing, releasing five Taliban senior officials is not only against the law, it's illegal and wrong, and he should never have done it. But I got here last night, and I was in the hotel lobby and talking to some delegates, and one of them said, well, gosh, you know, there is one guy who is kind of deserving. We ought to try to get home, and that's the Marine who accidentally carried his guns into Mexico. So here's what I'm thinking. Mr. President, you love to trade people. Why don't we set up a trade, but this time, instead of five Taliban, how about five Democrats? I'm thinking John Kerry, Hillary Clinton, Nancy Pelosi. Couldn't we send them to Mexico? I come from Washington. Don't hold that against me. That's where I was most recently. But I've got good news and bad news for you. The good news is your government's open. The bad news is your government's open. Your government's open and borrowing over a million dollars every minute. It's literally out of control. And you know, the president, what he says, he says, I won't negotiate. I won't negotiate with terrorists. With the, well, actually, he will. I won't negotiate with those Republicans. I won't negotiate with a gun to my head. But you know, in 2011, we did get him to negotiate. We got something called the sequester. Didn't actually cut spending, but it cut the rate of increase of spending. But I'm pretty damn disappointed. You know, we just gave up on that. We can't even slow down the rate of increase. And some Republicans were complicit with this. We've got to do a better job. We, we can't, we've got to hold the line. We can't, we've got to, at the very least, slow down the rate of growth. But I will tell you a story from the shutdown. During the shutdown, they sent a message to every representative's office, and they asked to us to list who is essential and who is unessential on your staff. And I thought, hmm, there's a lesson we could learn here. Certainly there's a lesson here. So I asked my staff, I said, give me a list, not only for our office, but for the IRS, the EPA, OSHA, HHS. So I get the list, and I get the list from the IRS, 90% unessential. <laughs> the EPA, 95% unessential. And I'm like, we got a lesson here. We're learning, we're coming to something. But then I learned the trick was on me. The trick is those in Washington who manipulate the system for their own benefit, they know more than all of us combined. They manipulate and use the system because guess what? If you were declared unessential, you don't have to go to work. But guess what? You still get paid. It costs us money to have the government closed. The government's the only thing you can shut down completely, and it still costs more money than when it's open. It's a disgrace. 
But here's the thing. They were finally going through the rolls, and someone looked at the EPA and said, well, let's look at some of the individual employees. So they found a woman, hadn't been to work in 20 years. She had a chronic illness, and maybe she could work for home, but they looked for the last five years. She had no work product and no communication with work for five years. Still being paid more than $100,000 a year. In fact, of the unessential people in all the departments, there's 100,000 making a, over $100,000 a year who were declared unessential. So they found this woman, hadn't been at work in 20 years, hadn't, been given, hadn't even sent an email back in five years, so you'd think they'd fired her, right? No. She's a government employee. You can't fire a government employee. So they went down the list. They found another woman. She was selling jewelry and vitamins from her computer. She had hired 17 relatives, paid interns that she was taking care of. Well, you'd think they'd fire her. No, no way. You can't fire a government employee. They found one guy who's downloading porn six hours a day. You'd think, for goodness sakes, they fired him. He still works at the EPA. But my favorite, or, or the most notorious of all of these, is Jonathan Beal. Jonathan Beal, they were looking through, and they said, he's worked for 11 years for the EPA. He's, he must be a stellar employee. Every review, every time he's passed review, he's gotten a bonus. Makes $150,000 a year. He's the right-hand man to Gina McCarthy. But he's never there. He hadn't been there in three weeks. He hadn't been there much in the last six months. He had whole periods of time of six months he hadn't been there. So they did something extraordinary. The investigator general called his boss. And his boss said, well, oh, Jonathan Beal, he's a secret agent as well as an EPA agent. <laughs> really? He's a secret agent and an e EPA agent. And they were like, but then they did something ex really extraordinary. They called the CIA. And they said, Jonathan who? So I'm just imagining this guy for 11 years, says he's a secret agent. I'm imagining him by his pool, which you bought and paid for. He's laying by his pool in the Chase Lounge, and he's got a beer. And his boss calls and says, Jonathan, aren't you coming in? He's like, can't come in. I'm in Istanbul on secret assignment. The Democrats say there's nothing we can cut. It's been cut to the bone, waste. There's no way we could cut anything. I sent the president a letter. I'm still waiting on a response. There's $100 billion unaccounted for. They spent it, but they don't know where. If you were simply to freeze hiring, just hire nobody new, just let the people who normally retire from the federal government retire save $6 billion. We have $20 billion a year keeping up with unoccupied federal buildings. Janitorial, sweeping, carpeting, everything you do in a building with nobody in it, $20 billion. We give $20 billion directly in aid to corporations, big corporations. The top 100 companies in our country get on average $200 million a year. You know what I say? Why don't we start with corporate welfare? Let's end it all. But if you look at overall the overall budget and you say, well, gosh, well, when the shutdown happened, I guess everything closed. Wrong. Two-thirds of your government's on autopilot. Two-thirds of your government is Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. It's called mandatory spending. We don't even vote on it. But it is short of money. It's short of money because we had a whole bunch of kids after World War II and then less kids and less kids each generation. We're living longer. All good things. In fact, people say, is it Republicans' fault? Or is it Democrats' fault? And I said, it's your grandparents' fault for having too many damn kids. <laughs> but it's fixable, but you would have to make some difficult choices about Social Security. You'd have to tell people like me, you're going to have to wait a little longer. You may get a little less. You don't have to do anything to the current retirees, but the next generation, you're going to have to fix it by saying we have to wait a little longer. But these are tough decisions. The first week I was up there, I met with the president. And I'm sitting across the table from him, and I said, Mr. President, You'd be a hero. Work with us. Do the right thing. Be a stand-up guy, and let's just gradually raise the age. A month or two a year for 30 years. 
It'll be very slow. It'll be as painless as possible. But you'll be a hero for doing the right thing instead of demagoguing this issue. Next week, the advertisement came out with Grandma in the wheelchair being pushed off of the cliff because that's what Republicans are supposedly for. Not an ounce of decency to fix the real problems. But two-thirds of your government never shut down. So when we had shut down, we had a third of the government shut down. Half of that's the military. We did do the right thing. Within days, we paid the bills and we kept the military open. So now we're at a sixth of the government. But you know what? The president was worried you might not notice. So you know what he did? He wrapped the World War II monument. He paid hundreds of workers to get out of there. There is no entrance, if you've ever been there. There's no entrance, there's no exit, there is no attendant, there is no cost. Some guy's gotta mow the yard, but I mean, it was paid for with private money. But the thing is, is he wrapped it and wrapped it and wrapped it. But if you wanna be left with one image of the shutdown, be left with this image. The World War II veterans cutting the binders, picking up the barricades, and throwing them on the lawn at the White House. But sometimes I get disappointed where we are, and I'll give you an example. Entitlements is the bulk of the nature of the deficit we run in Washington. It's difficult, it's emotional, but should be addressed. But occasionally we have just the ridiculous brought up, the ridiculous waste that everybody in their right brother you would think would vote for. So we had $3 million that they chose to cut. This was in the House of Representatives. $3 million for Twiggy the water skiing squirrel. Now, I like dumb pet tricks, OK? If you send me an email with a dumb pet trick, I will watch it. But I'm not willing to pay or spend $3 million of your money on Twiggy the water skiing squirrel. Now, what is Twiggy the water skiing squirrel doing for the taxpayer? Twiggy the water skiing squirrel is promoting the sale of American walnuts in Spain. And if you've got a walnut farm, God love you, but you sell your own damn walnuts, all right? But here's the problem. Here's the rub. We had a vote, cut $3 million, and the liberals all say, well, that won't balance the budget. Yeah, but we got to start somewhere. So we had a vote. It failed like 320 to 90. Over half of the Republicans voted to keep Twiggy the Squirrel. Most of the Democrats voted to keep Twiggy the Squirrel. If we can't cut Twiggy the Squirrel, how are we ever going to fix the bigger problems in our country? So it is important which Republicans you send. I know you've just been through spirited primaries and that, but it is important. It's important you hold all of our feet to the fire, mine included. Make us do the right thing. <laughs> there have been a lot of scandals under President Obama. I sort of say it's like old McDonald's pharma scandals. Here a scandal, there a scandal, everywhere a scandal. <laughs> But the one that bothers me probably the most is Benghazi. Four Americans died. And to me, it has very little to tell you the truth with all the talking points. Is that obfuscation? Is it spin? Was it wrong? Yes. But what really gets my goat is for six months, they asked for reinforcements. They asked for more security. They asked for a plane. In May of that year, six months in advance to this, they asked for a DC-3. They asked Hillary Clinton. We'd like a DC-3 in case there's an emergency. It's a 50-year-old plane. They got a no. Deafening silence from Hillary Clinton. On the night of the attack, when they're trying to send reinforcements from Tripoli to Benghazi, they're scrambling to get on a plane. You know what they're doing? They're begging the Libyans to let them use a plane because there was no plane present. It's inexcusable. Three days after the plane was turned down, Hillary Clinton approved $100,000 for a charging station in the, for the embassy in Vienna. Seems the ambassador wanted to green the place up, so he bought up a lot of electric cars and then discovered that he didn't have a charger for them. So we spent another 100,000 on top of the $250,000 per car so he could spruce up and green up the embassy. 
So they've got money to, to show how green we are. They spent $650,000. Hillary Clinton's State Department spent $650,000 on Facebook ads trying to get more friends for the State Department. They spent $700,000 this same summer. They didn't provide security. $700,000 for landscaping for the embassy in Brussels. They spent $5 million on crystal wear, bar wear and glasses. $5 million. Not enough money for security in Benghazi. They spent $100,000 sending three comics to India on the Make Chai Not War tour. But no money for reinforcements. In August of that year, the ambassador himself sent a cable to Hillary Clinton. When she came before my committee, I asked her, did you read his cables? And she said, no, sir, I did not. To me, that's a dereliction of duty that should preclude Hillary Clinton from ever being considered for higher office. Thank you. If we want to win nationally, we're going to have to be a bigger, better, bolder party. This debate's going on nationwide. Some in our party say, oh, we need to dilute the message. We need to become Democrat light. I say we need to keep our message and be bolder with our message. I hear Republicans in Washington saying, oh, we're for revenue neutral tax reform. If that's what we're for, I'll go home. I'll go back to being a doctor. I'll go back to Kentucky. I have no use in saying, let's keep the taxes the same. Let's tax Mr. Jones a little bit less and Mrs. Smith a little bit more and keep the taxes the same. Ronald Reagan was dramatically for cutting taxes and creating jobs. We should be for that again. Bigger, better, bolder. To be bigger, we need new people. There's not enough of us. We need new people in our party. The party needs to look like the rest of America, white, black, brown, with tattoos, without tattoos. It needs to look like America. We're the party that believes in the Second Amendment. We don't give up on that. But we need to become the party that also believes in the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, the First Amendment. A few years ago, I had a debate over whether or not an American citizen could be held indefinitely without a trial, without a lawyer. I had this debate. There was another Republican senator on the floor, and he said, yes, if they're dangerous, I said, you would send them to Guantanamo Bay without a trial, without a, without a lawyer? He says, yes, if they're dangerous. And I said, it kind of begs the question, doesn't it? Who gets to decide? There was something that was sent out by the Department of Justice, the current president's Department of Justice, saying who you should be aware of. These are the people that might be dangerous. Those who pay in cash. Those who have multiple guns in the house. I don't want to see a show of hands. No show of hands. <laughs> Those who have more than seven days of food in their house. That would be half of the state of Utah, okay? <laughs> on one website, they say you might be a terrorist if you have more than seven days worth of food. On another one, the one for hurricanes, they say you need to have more than four days of food to be prepared for a hurricane. Which is it? But the point is, we need to be aware of what justice is about, what the Bill of Rights is about. This is a message above and beyond our crowd that has normally attracted the Republican Party. This is a message for any minority, whether it's a minority of the color of your skin or the shade of your ideology, whether you're black, white, brown, or whether you're a homeschooler, or whether you go to a church that believes in sin and good, wrong, bad. This is what the Bill of Rights are about.
And I'll give you an example of why you need to be careful before you just let people be shipped off to a prison. You remember Richard Jewell? They said he was the Olympic bomber. He had a backpack. He looked like a nerd. Everybody said he was quiet. He showed up mysteriously. Only problem, and everybody said he was guilty. The news media convicted him with, within moments. Only problem was he wasn't the bomber. He wasn't guilty. What I would ask each and every one of us to remember or to think about is if Richard Jewell had been a black man in the South in the 1920s, he might not have lived the rest of the day. We need to take the message that we are the party of the Bill of Rights. We are the party of voting rights. We are the party of minority rights. Some have asked, well, what will happen if Republicans take over? Number one, I tell you what, let's don't be the party that bails out banks and big business. Why don't we be the party that says, you know what? Why don't we read the bills before we pass them? I know that's pretty radical. I have a bill that would require Congress to wait 20 days for every page of legislation. This would be, this is sort of a double whammy here. You're going to get shorter bills and you'll have a waiting period. Here's the problem. We actually have some rules. I think it's rule 22 in the Senate it says you have to wait at least 48 hours. Well, four hours after I got a 600-page bill, they're like, we're passing it. And I said, what about rule 22? And he says, or not he, they, said, the rules are whatever the majority says the rules are. If the majority says day is night, day is night. So they just passed it anyway without reading it. Obamacare's 2,000 pages. If my rule were to pass, we'd wait 100 days, we'd read the damn thing, and we never would have passed it. I think we should have a rule that says Congress shall pass no law that they exempt themselves from. I think we ought to have term limits. Now, some want to say, oh, that's, uh, you're casting aspersions at a certain person. I say, no, look, my dad was there for a while, and he was a great man, and I think he did a great job. <laughs> term limits only work not voluntarily. They work if we all do it. But I think we do need a turnover. I've been in the private sector. I've been a physician. I've been to Washington. And believe me, there's no monopoly on knowledge in Washington. I would cut congressional pay in half. But I would only have them up there half as much. And I would institute a work requirement. Both when we're in Washington, but also outside of Washington. I think we should keep our jobs. I think we should stay in our communities, go back and forth, and continue to work. If we need to be a bigger, better, bolder party, we need to do it with optimism. There's a painter by the name of Robert Henry, and he said, Paint like a man coming over the hill singing. I love the image of that. What we need to do is we need to proclaim our message with the passion of Patrick Henry, but also proclaim our message like a man coming over the hill singing. When we do, we'll be the dominant party again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.